I am Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jason Thorum. Going to talk today about rethinking chip economics. Jason, what are you seeing changing in chip economics these days? What we're really seeing now is from a variety of our IC manufacturers and providers, a decreasing selection in supply as we reduce our technology nodes. What's driving that? Uh, fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's skyrocketing fab costs. As we keep shrinking these technology nodes, they just get more and more expensive to build more of these ICs. And so what's the upshot of that? Are they building fewer ICs? Are they building more uh, big ones? I mean, how's this all changing? Yeah, another good question. What, what you've seen from a lot of the FPGA companies, even the SOC companies, is they just keep adding more and more uh, features and functionality to the device, increasing that integration which has a side effect, which is also increasing the complexity of these devices. Let's take a closer look. Great. Jason, that complexity that you mentioned is not just static, right? This is constant change. Exactly. You can look at many of the algorithms and problems we're trying to solve these days, whether it's AI or image signal processing and network protocols, they're constantly evolving and it requires adaptability to solve those problems. And also because of the cost of the developing these chips, you want them to be in the market longer than what you did in the past. This is not the high volume, we're gonna sell a billion units. These are potentially millions of units, right? Right, when you're, especially when you're getting into uh, the risk factors involved with taping out the, the very advanced technology nodes and building millions and millions of chips. And you want that product to be in the market space for a very long time. The threats that come from us from security or protocols evolving or m algorithms and models evolving over time, the only way to keep your product in that market and de-risk yourself and get that return on investment on your chip tape out is to have that required adaptability. Because these, you're paying more for these devices, you also need to have them in the market longer. They have to be reliable for longer. So what's, how do you adapt to that? What do you have to do? It's a great question. Think about IoT devices where your Nest or your Google home devices out in your home. And we've seen the examples in the past with baby monitors, where baby monitors have been hacked and that product had to be removed from the market. We've seen uh, uh, cases even in automotive where vehicles have been hacked and those solutions have had to be evolved over time. If your goal is to be in the market for a long time, especially in IoT type applications, having this kind of flexibility to adapt to security threats and protocols and encryption standards is all very valuable. Most people dealt with that in the past in software, but their software has its drawbacks, right? It's slower, it's more less power efficient, right. and it's also potentially more expensive by the time you get done with everything because you have to do a lot of changes. That's right. The easiest way to implement any algorithm is through software. What we find in so many cases and why there's a very massive FPGA market out there that so many of these algorithms run better in a pipelined and parallel nature. That's where uh, embedded FPGA technology can solve these problems. Now, the, the algorithms that are being developed, not only can they be accelerated in this hardware, but this hardware can also adapt over time because it's reprogrammable. What does that do in terms of security? Because you think about security, you think about a product that's going to be in a market for 10 years, for example, in, an, right. in a car, the capability to hack into something are going to be very different in 10 years than they are today. The fundamental thought in the security world today is any decisions made today about security will inevitably be proven wrong in five or 10 years. So that concept alone requires all chip manufacturers to start considering and thinking about using embedded, embedded programmable and reprogrammable solutions in their chips. There's another angle here too, which is that as you get into these very competitive markets with these killer applications that are in constant flux here, you're going to have ECOs by the time you get out the, this chip out the door, it's going to be very different. The demands are going to be different than what you originally started out with, right? Correct. Uh, we've seen that in so many use cases, uh, even thinking like smart NICs and those applications where protocols and threats when they tape out the chip and their packet processing pipelines uh, were built to address those types of challenges. But as the networks and the threats have evolved, the only solution now that these manufacturers have is to rebuild the chip. But with some reprogrammability in that packet processing pipeline, you have the ability to accommodate and, and, and mitigate these threats. 
Another factor we're seeing is that regional requirements are changing dependent upon where you are. So you think about automotive, the requirements are in one market may be very different than another. Same with security. How do you deal with that? I'd say it's beyond automotive. It's in your cell phones, your IoT devices. Now, if you look at what's happening in the United States versus uh, Europe or Japan, Korea, China, all of these unique regions have their own unique regional requirements. And to develop one product that can address all of those markets is very difficult because it's not only the security threats that you mentioned, but it's the protocols that uh, each of these networks use, and it's even compression algorithms that they're all, they're all different across these markets. So you put those three different things together, whether it's security algorithm, the protocols, or, or the compression algorithm, one chip to build that is very difficult. So with some adaptability, you have the flexibility to address all the unique needs of those markets. What changes from the standpoint of as you start building this flexibility in, how do you test that? How do you make sure that the bugs are all out of it? Because nobody can build a chip that's bug-free. Bugs will happen and occur over time. Having some amount of reprogrammability in your device can address some of these issues. And it's more than just bugs. Think about if you have an external interface like a, an LCD or a cryptography chip or an interface and um, that changed because your supplier for that device for your screen went away and you need to have a second source come in but the interface is slightly different. Having that reprogrammability enables you to adapt to those kinds of challenges as well. We're dealing with increasingly heterogeneous designs too. In the past you thought about things and it was here's a chip, this is what you get, it's, it's monolithic, it's on one, one block. Now we're starting to see lots of different pieces coming in here. How do those pieces go together? How do you know it's going to work together? And what, what do you have to do in terms of reprogramming potential, potentially other parts of this? Well, as the way that manufacturers are solving the limited IC availability is by building more complex and uh, heterogeneous chips to solve more problems. They're trying to address more market spaces by putting more features in the chip. The, backs, uh, the downside of that is that you now have a chip that's more complicated to bring up. You have more of a, a more complicated chip that is to program and to understand. When you get into these more complex chips, going through a life cycle there of the, how this chip goes into market, whether it's you know just even bringing the chip up the first time, having some insight through reprogrammable solutions into that gives you that ability in that first phase of life of that product to bring it up and make sure all these complicated systems work together, data's flowing the way it needs to show. Having that visibility into your chip is very valuable. Now, as your chip moves into your productization part of life, that same IP that you were using to bring up that chip and do its early stages of life, that when it moves into production, that same piece of IP now becomes your reprogrammable security block, your flexible packet processing block, or your compression block that's flexible to meet those different market needs. You're fundamentally changing how we think about a chip though here, because in the past it was, here's your chip, this is going to work, it's gonna be as, as complete as possible. What you're dealing with now is so many different changes that you're going from this is completely bulletproof to this is going to be resilient, right? What's the golden rule in engineering? <laughs> the only constant is change. And that is certainly the world we live in these days. You can't show me a protocol, a compression algorithm, a security algorithm, anything that hasn't changed dramatically in the last few years. This is critical to the lifespan of current modern chips and providing solutions that solve real customer problems. You also are looking at differentiation that may change over time here too, right? Because as you develop this chip, if it takes you 18 months or two years to develop this chip, you may already see a competitor in the market. So now what do you do about it? Great. And not only do you have competitors in the market before you tape out your chip, you're going to have competitors in the market after you tape out your chip. Realistically, this reprogrammable solution in your chip is a white space like this. It's a, it's completely open to you and your innovation and your genius to figure out how to solve a problem in that customer's market that's uniquely different than their competitor had done it. So when you have this kind of technology available to you, it is really Pandora's box to what you can do and how you can solve those problems and you can enable that differentiation over your competitors. Jason Bethorum, thanks for a great explanation. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Ed.